Okay, last week, we're archaeology in the Bible. I'm looking at this, the sojourn in Egypt. And so last week, I suggested to you that Pharaoh Thutmose the first, right, yeah? Thutmose the first, that he was the Pharaoh who issued the decree to kill all the male Israelite children, and that Hatshepsut was the, she's the daughter of Thutmose I and Queen Achmose. She was the princess who rescued Moses from the river and raised Moses up in the palace as her stepson. Now, I neglected to mention when I showed you her mummy, which was positively identified in 2007, I neglected to mention to you that examination of the mummy reveals that Hatshepsut died in her 50s. So if you take the middle point there, for example, let's say 55. Let's say that was the age. So she died from 50 to 59, as they estimated. If we take her age at death as 55, her death being in 1488, according to Douglas Petrovich's chronology, that then puts her at age 17 in the year of Moses' birth, 1526. Okay, so I thought that was worth uh, adding because uh, I neglected to say that. Now, Thutmose the first and Queen Akmos, I mentioned last week, they had no sons. And so when Thutmose the first, when he died in 1516, he was succeeded by Thutmose the second, the son that he'd had by another woman, this Mutnefert. So he had quite a name there. So he, that Thutmose the second, so Thutmose the first and Queen Akmos, they have a daughter, Hatshep, so no son. When he dies in 1516, the son he had by another woman then succeeds him as Pharaoh, and Thutmose II married his half-sister, Hatshepsut, and as I explained, the rationale for that was to try to bring a Pharaoh in the royal bloodline. So they wanted to preserve that. But they only had a daughter, Nefriure. So when Thutmose II died in 1506, he was succeeded by Thutmose III, the son he had by another woman, Isis. So this is a, just kind of reviewing what I went through. Now, because Thutmose III was only an infant or a small child, when Thutmose II died in 1506, the queen, Hatshepsut, became a de facto co-ruler because this, this child can't be running things. So she becomes a de facto co-ruler, which she fully exploits. She exploits this to the point that she becomes a complete full pharaoh. As I said, there are statues of her with the pharaonic beard. So she's full on pharaoh. And then so she reigns as pharaoh from 1506 after her husband Thutmose II dies. She's a co-ruler with Thutmose III until her death in 1488. And then Thutmose III continues to rule as the sole pharaoh down until his death in 1452. Okay, Thutmose III marries his half-sister, same rationale, Nefriure, and they succeed in having a son, Amenhotep II, and he becomes co-ruler with Thutmose III during the last few years of Thutmose III's reign. Okay, so you see he comes to the throne 1455, Thutmose dies in 1452, so you have a brief period of overlap, which you see that happening with the, with the kings in Israel and Judah. So this is so you have, you have him reigning there at, at, at that brief time. So Amenhotep, this is correct, this makes Amenhotep is the pharaoh of the Exodus. Remember, the Exodus is in 1446, reign is 1455 to 1418, and here's, here's the mummy I showed you of Amenhotep II last week. Now, when we ended, I was addressing the question of how he could be the pharaoh of the Exodus when he didn't drown in the Red Sea. And I pointed out to you that Exodus 14, there are a number of texts in Exodus 14 that draw a distinction between Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And according to Exodus 14, verse 28, it was those chariots and horsemen that were killed, the host of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. And I also wanted to point out to you that Exodus 15, 4, 
It says, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The fact it specifies his chosen officers without identifying Pharaoh himself suggests that Pharaoh was not among the dead. Now, I wanted to finish that point of, well, how can he be the Pharaoh when he didn't drown? And I wanted to finish that by addressing there are a couple of psalms that people bring up. And here's one is Psalm 106, 9, particularly verse 11. But in this psalm, it simply says the waters of the Red Sea covered the adversaries and doesn't specify Pharaoh. So you've got people who are pursuing them into the Red Sea and it covers the adversaries. I think the one that more people rely on is Psalm 136, verses 13 to 15. And it says, To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever, but overthrew, this is the English Standard Version, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now there are other translations. See, this says overthrew Pharaoh and his host, but includes Pharaoh in the Red Sea. All right, it sounds like, well, Pharaoh's part of who's getting drowned in the Red Sea. Other translations go further, and you see they will say hurled or tossed or swept Pharaoh and his host into the Red Sea. Well, if it says that he tossed Pharaoh into the Red Sea, okay, well, then Pharaoh was in the Red Sea. Okay, but things aren't always as they appear, right? The verb that they is swept or overthrew, this verb means literally to shake off. You see here, just to show you I'm not making that up, here's a standard Hebrew lexicon, Brown Driver Briggs, shake, shake out, or shake off. Theological word book of the Old Testament, shake, shake out, shake off. And you see a number of translations, New American Standard, New American Standard Updated, New English Translation, English Standard Version, they will footnote and they will say Hebrew to shake off. Okay, so they take that shaking off kind of loose and say, well, overthrew or swept. Okay, I'm going to suggest to you it's better to take it literally. Shake off. And then we have the fact that the prepositions, as you know, prepositions have broad ranges of meaning. The preposition that is used here can mean in, at, by, among. And to show you I'm not making that up, here's another standard lexicon, Hebrew lexicon, Kohler and Baumgartner, talking about the meaning of the preposition. It can mean at. So basic meaning local and instrumental, in, at, and we could get other meanings. Okay, so what I think ought, we ought to do is put the literal meaning of the verb with the meaning of the preposition, at, and then we wind up with this. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever, and shook off Pharaoh and his host at the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. Then the, the, the meaning then is that he broke off their pursuit at the Red Sea by drowning the host of Pharaoh that had followed Israel into the Red Sea. So it need not mean that Pharaoh was among those who drowned. Okay, and I think that's the way to understand it. If, you, if that's a bridge too far for you, well, then you'll reject the notion that Amenhotep is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. But I think that's the right way to understand it. Now, certainly God didn't have to kill Pharaoh to gain glory over him. As he says, he's going to gain glory over Pharaoh. He says that in Exodus 14, 4 and 17 and 18. I mean, certainly administering a humiliating defeat to Pharaoh, to his great army. Defeating Pharaoh and his great army at the hands of a rabble of largely unarmed and recently freed civilian slaves. That certainly makes the point of God's supremacy, doesn't it? And it makes it clear that God could take Pharaoh's life anytime he chose to. But rather, he's going to humiliate Pharaoh and have Pharaoh stand as a testament to that. So that's that question. You say, well, if Amenhotep II is the Pharaoh of the Exodus, how can that be when he didn't drown in the Red Sea? I've just given you my thinking on that. There is another question that comes up. And look, the second question is, how can, if Pharaoh is, if Amenhotep II is the Pharaoh of the Exodus, why didn't he die in the tenth plague that killed the firstborn of the Egyptians? I mean, if he's a firstborn son, he's becoming Pharaoh, shouldn't he have died? Okay, well, that's, that's certainly a, a, a question here you have here. 
he's he's here during the during if he's Thutmose's first born, well then during the the tenth plague, shouldn't he have died? Well, as you might imagine, the answer is is that he wasn't the eldest of Thutmose, Thutmose the third. Thutmose the third's firstborn son was Amenemhet, and he was Amenemhet was the older half brother of An Amenhotep II, and he died before Amenhotep II assumed the throne. So he wasn't the firstborn. So that problem goes away. And then you have another issue that you say, okay, well then, then how about, how about Amenhotep II's, let me get where I am here. How about his successor, his son, Thutmose IV? If that was his firstborn, well, wouldn't he have died in the ex in the, during the 10th plague? Okay, well, he wasn't the firstborn. Uh, he wasn't. It turns out that's not a problem because he thought most the fourth is not Amenhotep's oldest son. That's clear from inscriptions. That's clear from other written documentation. And you can find that in, in the papers by Douglas Petrovich that are cited in the paper that I have online, Israel, Egypt, and the Exodus. So those problems uh, don't stop the idea. Okay, so that's why a lot of people reject him out of hand kind of thing, and I think that's a mistake. When you see what's going on with Amenhotep and how he fits chronologically and all these other pieces that fit, more that I'm going to mention to you, I think that you can see that the Bible's not as clear on some of those things as people sometimes say. Now, as I mentioned last week and I think the week before, after Akmos expelled the Hyksos, you remember the foreign rulers who were there? from like 1670 down to 1560 when Akmos comes up from the south, expels them, and then he, they have, after a 110-year reign, the Egyptians, they constructed a royal citadel. You see the Greens, the Egyptian occupation, right here in the same spot where the Hyksos had had theirs, and that's at this site of, this is Tel El Daba. This is that archaeological site. Now, Gary Byers remarks, he says, while the national capital for the 18th dynasty, that's the dynasty that began with Akmos when he boots out the Hyksos in 1560, he says, while the national capital for the 18th dynasty pharaohs was in Memphis, 13 miles south of Cairo, after the Hyksos experience, where you've had these foreign rulers ruling from a center at Tel El Daba, so after you had those, the Hyksos experience, a royal presence would always have been as necessary, seen as necessary for national security in the Nile's eastern delta. You see here, here is Memphis down here, which is the national capital down here. But maybe 100 miles north is Tel El Daba, and that's where the Hyksos had, had the center of their foreign rule of Egypt. So he's saying that after you booted them out, you could see why you would want a royal presence further north up in the eastern delta to be more responsive and to be more tuned in because we didn't have cars and all this kind of stuff. So it's something to have news get here and come down and react so you want a royal presence and that's why they're building this palace and this complex that they built there. Now at the time Moses and Amenhotep II were there at Tel El Daba, the complex, that, that palace complex that they had built in that section was about 13 and a half acres. Now they know that from the excavations that have been done at Tel El Daba, and it consisted of three palaces, which the archaeologists have labeled palaces F, G, and J. And I'm going to show you a little diagram of this in a second. It included three palaces, it included, it included associated buildings, and it included a perimeter wall. And the palaces F and G, they're parallel to each other, and they're separated by a large artificial lake or a large central square. They apparently can't tell the function of this rectangular area between the two palaces. But it was a pretty big deal. Now, one of these palaces, that may have been where Moses and Aaron confronted Amenhotep because they had a royal presence there for strategic reasons, and they had palaces there. So you could have had Amenhotep there, and that may have been where Moses and Aaron confronted him. It was constructed, this palace complex at Tel El Daba, it was constructed on the easternmost branch of the Nile, right there on the river, and that city served 
as a major naval stronghold during the time of Thutmose III, who was Amenhotep II's predecessor. So it was a, it was a major naval stronghold during the time of Thutmose III and during the time of Amenhotep II. Now here is a diagram that will just show you the area of the palace complex. You see here's the tributary, Nile, and right up next against that you have right here is the palace complex that they have excavated. Now here you can see, I hope, I don't know how, how this transmits at a distance, but here you see, so here you have Palace F, that's quite a complex. Here you have large Palace G, and here's Palace J. And here is the lake, or this plaza, that separated the two palaces. And then you have all these auxiliary buildings, and you have this wall around it. Uh, why don't you turn off there? Okay, so, so that's something now, very interestingly, at least interesting to me, this strategic center, this naval stronghold that is here on, in the eastern delta, it was mysteriously abandoned. So here you have, during the reign of Thutmose III, during Amenhotep's reign, you have the Tel El Daba, this naval stronghold. You have these royal palaces here, this great royal presence and this military power focused there, and then it's just abandoned. It's just a man, and there's nothing recorded in Egyptian history that explains the abandonment. Now, here's what the excavators of Tel El Daba say. It says, the palace district was probably, I ought to read over here, the palace district was probably abandoned after the reign of Amenophis, which is Amenhotep. You know how these names go. All right, so this is the same person. After, I'll just say Amenhotep, after the reign. Now, their idea is after. Hold that thought because Petrovich begs to differ. Okay, but they say the, pra the palace district was probably abandoned after the reign of Amenhotep II. The reason for the abandonment of this district, and presumably the entire city adjoining the district on the south, is an unsolved puzzle at this time. Its solution would be of the greatest importance to historians. All right, so we have this naval stronghold at Tel El Daba. We have this palace complex that is there, and all of a sudden it's abandoned. Oh, that is quite a mystery, right? Now, this abandonment, it's all the more intriguing in light of Douglas Petrovich's 2013 article that was published in the Journal of Ancient Egyptian Interconnections. This is a well-known publication, a peer-reviewed journal, and Petrovich is in the, he publishes an article there in which he makes a lengthy and detailed argument that the abandonment of this site wasn't after the time of Amenhotep, but rather it was during the reign of Amenhotep II. Now that's significant. And here's what, here's what Petrovich says. This is uh, three slides. I've got two lengthy quotes by Petrovich in here, but just bear, I, I, I wouldn't give them to you if I didn't think they were worth it. All right. He says, once the native Egyptians eradicated the foreign invaders who had dominated their landscape for over a century, that's the Hyksos, they quickly moved to rebuild the destroyed city and establish it as a storehouse, eventually to be utilized. You remember, we, we find there uh, all of those things, those huge grain silos and that kind of thing. He said, they quickly moved to rebuild the destroyed city and establish it as a storehouse, eventually to be utilized as a military garrison with weapon-making facilities. Peru Nefer slash Avaris, same place, became the most vital cog in the unprecedented military campaigning under the reigns of Thutmose III and Amenhotep II. So this is a pivotal military place during the reigns of these two pharaohs. Yet during the height of Egypt's enterprise and glory, her naval base was abandoned mysteriously and her imperialistic machinery ground to a halt. Egypt suddenly sought to make treaties rather than seize whatever she desired. Neither the site nor Egyptian annals provides an explicit answer as to why Avaris Perunefer was abandoned. Even years of excavation at the site have not answered this vital question. As Betak himself states, the reasons for this are very unclear. 
The available evidence indicates that the vacating of the site is understood best to have occurred during the reign of Amenhotep II rather than at the end of his reign or during the reign of Thutmose IV, who was his successor. Moreover, the historical evidence from Amenhotep II's reign points to the events of year 9. Now, he doesn't develop this there. What he, his argument is focused there on it was during Amenhotep's reign, not at the end of his reign or during the reign of his successor. So he makes a long, detailed argument to say it's better understood as during the reign. But he's convinced, and he has reasons to believe, it was specifically during year 9 of Amenhotep's reign. He says, moreover, the historical evidence from Amenhotep II's reign points to the events of year 9 as providing the key to unraveling the mysteries surrounding both the odd change in Egypt's political and military direction and the desertion of Egypt's vital naval base at the height of her imperialism. Now, year 9 in Amenhotep's II's reign, according to Petrovich's chronology, is 1446. Well, that's the year of the Exodus. Okay, so that's the year of the Exodus. So, uh, the odd change in Egypt's political and military direction to which Petrovich refers in that quote that I just read, it refers to the sudden curtailment of Egypt's aggression and imperialism at the seeming height of its power. I mean, here's Egypt just bossing it. And then all of a sudden, they abandon this thing and they shrink in. And they no longer are as imperialistic as they once were, or as aggressive. Thutmose III, Amenhotep II's predecessor, he was a renowned conqueror who led 17 military campaigns into the Levant. 17 campaigns going in there, you know, taking people out and we'd say and taking names. So he, he was a renowned conqueror. According to Petrovich, Amenhotep leads only two. So his predecessor leads 17 in the Levant. Amenhotep II leads two. And the last expedition or military campaign that Amenhotep II leads into the Levant is an incursion into Palestine six months after the Exodus. And it's a very rare November campaign. That's not when kings went to war. Kings didn't launch wars or campaigns at the beginning of winter. So here we have a rare November campaign into Palestine in 1446, six months after the Exodus. Now that, is, to me, is certainly intriguing, but the fact it's a November campaign, Petrovich argues that that suggests that this was a response to some kind of emergency. There needs to be some reason why a pharaoh would launch a military campaign at the beginning of winter. And so here, six months after the Exodus, we have this November campaign into Palestine. And the strangeness of that campaign, it's further reflected by the fact that the forces stayed closer to Egypt than in the prior campaign, which is the opposite of how successive campaigns were normally conducted. The way successive campaigns typically worked was you would go out, out further, out further, out further. That's not what happened here. Amenhotep II has two campaigns. He goes out further, and then in this second campaign, this odd November campaign, he stays closer. He only goes into Palestine. All right, so that's something that's odd. And you see another thing about it is the booty list that, he, that we have of his campaign in, from that time. He goes in there and he lists in that booty list. I want you to see we have lists of prisoners who were taken. From Thutmose III's first campaign, his sixth campaign, his seventh campaign, and from Amenhotep II's first campaign. And here you see the prisoners. 5,900, 217, 494, and Amenhotep's first one, 2,214. Well, this rare November campaign into Palestine, or southern Levant, 
He brings in 101,228 prisoners. 46 times, roughly, the number of prisoners he brought during his first campaign, roughly 46 times the average prisoner haul of the four campaigns that we have this information for. So it seems like it really is a kind of raid that they're making uh, where they're interested in getting prisoners. That number of prisoners seems like here that they needed to replenish, replenish the recently lost slave force. Why such an odd... Now, some people, oh, well, you know, they just boast in these things. I know they boast in these things. They boast about them all the time, though. So why all of a sudden do we now get 101,000? And see, that's consistent. If Look, if we've been depleted and we have to act fast because if word gets out that we've been nuked, then we're a sitting duck. So we, it's going to take some time after the devastation of the Exodus to gather up whatever we have left of forces, to train enough people and get them. Then we launch this emergency campaign, and what are we after? Bodies, slaves. We've got to bring prisoners in. Huge numbers to replenish those that went out during the Exodus. Now, regarding the reversal of foreign policy, Petrovich says this. Looks kind of small, doesn't it? He says, another oddity of A2, that's Amenhotep II's second campaign in the Levant. That's the November 1446 campaign. Another oddity of A2 is that after its conclusion, the Egyptian army established by Thutmose III as the 15th century B.C.'s most elite fighting force, went into virtual hibernation. Their previous policy of unwavering aggressiveness toward Mitanni became one of passivity and the signing of peace treaties. The reason for this new policy is missing from the historical record, but Amenhotep II evidently was the pharaoh who first signed a treaty with Mitanni subsequent to A2, his second excursion into Palestine, his second military campaign. Redford, who's an Egyptologist, connects this event to, quote, the arrival after year 10, we may be sure, of a Mitannian embassy sent by Mitanni's king, Sosatar, with proposals of brotherhood, i.e. a fraternal alliance and renunciation of hostilities, end quote. Redford adds that Amenophis II, Amenhotep, seems susceptible to negotiations, end quote, and that he was apparently charmed and disarmed by the embassy from Naharin and perhaps even signed a treaty. Now, he's quoting this other guy because he wants you to see that it's not at all bizarre to believe that the peacemaker was Amenhotep II. Here we have this noted Egyptologist who's in that camp. He has his other reasons for thinking it. Well, they brought up a really persuasive guy. Uh, Petrovich isn't buying it. He says, I don't believe these, you know, th this militaristic, dominant, a group is all of a sudden going to be swayed. Well, wow, he's really in the, wow, they sent a nice guy. You know, who knew? Okay, but they're true, but he, he's citing him just so you'll see that point. He says, yet such a treaty is completely out of character for imperial Egypt and this prideful monarch, especially since the pharaonic state of the 18th dynasty could more easily than Mitanni sustain the expense of periodic military incursions 800 kilometers into Asia. Support for Amenhotep II being the first to sign a pact with Mitanni is found in the actions of Thutmose IV. Now, he's quoting somebody else here. Only by postulating a change of reign can we explain a situation in which the new pharaoh, Thutmose IV, can feel free to attack Mitanni and holdings with impunity. So he's saying, you see, it looks like Amenhotep is the peacemaker. Amenhotep is the treaty maker. And that's significant. He says, why would Am Amenhotep II do the unthinkable and opt to make a treaty with Mitanni? The mysterious reversal of foreign policy would remain unexplainable and unthinkable if not for the possibility of a single cataclysmic event. If the Egyptians lost virtually their entire army in the springtime disaster at the Red Sea in year 9, a desperate reconnaissance campaign designed to save face with the rest of the ancient world and to replenish their Israelite slave base would be paramount. 
Certainly the Egyptians would have needed time to rally their remaining forces together, however small or in shambles their army may have been, and it would explain a November campaign that was nothing more than a slave raid into Palestine as a show of force. The Egyptians could not afford to live through the winter without the production that was provided by the Hebrew workforce, and they could not allow Matani or any other ancient power to consider using the winter to plan an attack on Egyptian territories which would seem vulnerable. Now, I see that as reasonable. Yeah, yeah. You see? And I say, well, you, can you prove? No, look, we're talking about digging up stuff and historical stuff, and we're putting together theories, right? But what I'm saying to you is this makes sense to me. And it's not all, well, can you prove that mathematically? No, but that's how so much is in life, right? I mean, that's how you are drawing inferences and in things, and you're saying, well, this fits uh, quite nicely, by the way. It fits very well with what I'm reading in Scripture. Now, in addition to that booty list of Amenhotep II's, uh, that second campaign, uh, it refers to other foreign rulers having heard of his great victories. So he takes this November 1446 campaign, which is a sl essentially a slave raid, into Palestine. And then he mentions in here this fact that other foreign rulers heard of his great victories. Now, Petrovich says, this reference to the effect of a military campaign upon kings of distant nations, all of whom ruled empires in their own right, is unique among contemporary Egyptian booty lists and annals. So... During this time, you have other booty lists, you have annals, and none of them do this, except this one. And so when he sees something like that, he thinks that may be significant. This concern over how other kings viewed his year nine conquest, his 1446 conquest, may be the result of his needing a victorious campaign after the exodus to ward off suspicions that Egypt could, was no longer able to wage war. You see, so he's very concerned. If I go out and do this, maybe when they hear these words and they hear this, they're going to tell, look, people are always saying stuff about God's doing things and all this. So now when they hear this, maybe they'll say, no, I'm not about to gamble on that. They just, they just went down and they cleaned out down here. So he's interested in that. And so that's something else that's cons consistent. And another intriguing bit of evidence that's supportive of the claim that Amenhotep II was the pharaoh of the Exodus is the subsequent desecration of Hatshepsut's image. Now, her image, see, at some point after her death, a concerted effort was made to remove her from Egyptian history. There was a concerted effort made to expunge her memory. And Petrovich writes about that. He says, many inscribed cartouches. This is a, a carved oval that has symbols in it. And royal cartouches, they have a line under them. And that's an indication that the symbols are a royal name. Okay, so he says, many inscribed cartouches of her were erased while her busts were smashed or broken into pieces, perhaps by gangs of workmen dispatched to various sites throughout Egypt. In some cases, the culprits carefully and completely hacked out the silhouette of her image from carvings, often leaving a distinct, uh, a distinct hatshepsut-shaped lacuna in the middle of a scene, often as a preliminary step to replacing it with a different image or royal cartouche, usually that of Thutmose I or II. At Karnak, her obelisks were walled up and incorporated into the vestibule in front of Pylon V, while at Jezer Jezeru, her statutes and sphinxes were removed, smashed, and cast into trash dumps. So you see here that there is this effort going on to expunge her from Egyptian cultural memory. Now, though most Egyptologists, they are convinced that that campaign against her memory, they're convinced it was waged by Thutmose III, her stepson. And they argue that, well, it was done because of some, some sense of sexist shame for his having shared the throne with a female ruler. But there are a lot of problems with that theory. You see, it's inconsistent 
with how he otherwise treated Hatshepsut's memory, and it was done too long after she left office for that motive to make much sense, and it doesn't explain why there were also attacks were made against Sinemut, who was her foreign, uh, her, her foreign chief advisor. So if you're bummed out that you're sharing the throne, why are you going after other people who were affiliated with her, who were part of her, uh, her rule and her reign? I mean, a much better candidate, this is Petrovich's idea, and it makes sense to me, a much better candidate for the one who's going after Hatshepsut is Amenhotep II. It's this guy. You can see, I mean, wouldn't, it make, wouldn't that make sense if Hatshepsut had raised Moses as her own son? Then that humiliating defeat and that devastating defeat at the Red Sea, that would have left this guy seething with rage against her. The kind of rage, you see, that would want to extinguish her existence in the afterlife, which is how they perceived removing somebody from social memory. That was their understanding, that if I could take you out of the cultural recollection, well, then I extinguish you in the afterlife. And so there's a great deal of hostility behind that. And so it would certainly fit with that. Now, around, around 1400, I see this is too small for you to see, isn't it? Yes. All right. Around 1400, we have, let's see, Amenhotep III. Okay? So we have Amenhotep II, his successor Thutmose IV, his successor Amenhotep III, 1408 to 1369. So around 1400, Amenhotep III built a temple in Soleb, which was then part of the Egyptian empire. It's now part of, of modern Sudan. He builds a temple that was dedicated to the Egyptian god Amun-Re. Now the inscribed topographical list at the temple, it refers to the land of the Shashu of Yahweh. You know, it's a topographical list. And it refers to the land of the Shashu of Yahweh. Now, the term Shashu, during this period of Egyptian history, is used almost exclusively for semi-nomadic peoples living in parts of Lebanon, Syria, Sinai, Canaan, and Transjordan. So here we have an Egyptian reference some 50 years after the Exodus, to a semi-nomadic people associated with the Levant who were devoted to Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. Now, that certainly suggests Egyptian familiarity with Israel and its God at a very early date, a familiarity that's consistent with the events of the Exodus. Here's what Charles Alling and Clyde Billington say about this particular inscription. They say, although we do not have all the information that we wish we did, it is significant that there are no mentions of the Shashu of Yahweh in Egyptian text earlier than the reign of Amenhotep III. You see, we say, well, if they're there for a long time and during this time, well, then why don't we see them mentioned before? It's only after the Exodus that we now have this idea, the land of the Shashu of Yahweh. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. If the group in question were Yahweh followers who never went to Egypt, why are they absent in topographical lists from the early period of the 18th dynasty, for example, from the extensive topographical list of Thutmose III? The reason may very well be because the Shashu of Yahweh were indeed the Israelites and that they were still living in Egypt in the early 18th dynasty. So they were there, not somewhere else. And that would make sense. He says, it thus appears very likely that the Shashu of Yahweh who are mentioned in the topographical text at Solib and Amara West, were the Israelites who by about 1400 B.C. had settled into their own land. Remember Exodus 1446, 40 years of wandering. We come in 1406. This is a rough estimate. How many years, decades later could it be? But they're kind of getting established there. He says, were the Israelites who about 1400 had settled into their own land in the mountains of Canaan. It also appears that for the ancient Egyptians, the one feature that distinguished the Israelites from all the other Shashu, Semitic herders in this area was their worship of the God of Yahweh. And so I found that uh, interesting and worth sharing with you. Now it also seems 
that likely that the name Israel was used in an, in an Egyptian inscription known as the Berlin Statue Pedestal Relief 21687. In 2001, there was a scholar named Manfred Gorg, a German. I think he's German. He, he published a new reading of an incomplete name on this inscription. In other words, sometimes they have to do detective work where you have something that's broken, and somebody says, I can determine from what I can see how the rest of this thing should look. Okay, well, when you're doing that, you're obviously, you know, in the academic world, you got people going to say, ah, you know how that works. You, you, you say something, and somebody else says, I can publish something that says something else. Yep. Okay, but this guy publishes this, and he goes into some detail and explains why he thinks that th this inscription that he completes, that he finds there an archaic form of the name Israel. Now, his, Gorg's proposed reading was disputed by an archaeologist named James Hoffmeyer. I'd mentioned him before. But then in 2010, you know, the empire strikes back. Gorg, who's now joined by some other scholars, Peter van der Veen at the University of Mainz and Christopher Thies at the University of Heidelberg, they then published a scholarly defense of the original reading with additional supporting evidence and the, the, the inscription itself, now it dates from the time of Ramesses II, which is the 13th century, which is the 1200s BC. You say, well, I mean, you know, okay, that, that's pretty, pretty late. But based on the spellings of the names, the guys who play in this world, they're convinced that it's been copied from an earlier inscription that dates to around 1400. Okay, so now we have, again, we have a... This would make it, if that's correct, this makes it the oldest express reference to Israel by a couple of centuries. And so that would be significant. And that, of course, fits with an exodus under Amenhotep II. So what is the bottom line? The sum of the matter, in my judgment, on this phase, we're in the archaeology and the Bible, we've been looking at the phase of Israel's sojourn in Egypt. We've got a long way to go on other things. But talking just about this phase... The sum of the matter to me is that those who reject the historicity of Scripture's account of Israel, Egypt, and the Exodus, they're being unreasonably skeptical. By that I mean you're setting the bar so high you can always do that. And I think in terms of historical investigation, you know, you, you can only demand so much reasonably. If I say I want metaphysical certainty, and until you get me that, until you give me no way I can squirt out, well, then, okay, you're always going to have a way to squirt out. You see, that's just how historical investigation is. They're demanding a kind or a quantum of evidence that's unrealistic given the limitations of archaeological investigation of ancient Egypt. When you lower those defenses, and that's why, see, the heart is so important. When you're willing to hear and willing to say, okay, is this possible? Once your heart is open to, all right, I'm willing to consider this might be true. Once you move to that point of objectivity, well, then you can see that Scripture is consistent with the historical data. You can appreciate the fact that there was a significant population from the land of Jacob's family in the precise area described in Scripture. At the precise time, they're said to have been there. Let me finish this last bit, so hold your breath. Won't be long. You can see that, that Python and Ramesses, that these are indeed storage cities, as stated in Scripture. And you can see the meshing of many biblical details with the chronology of Egyptian rulers. And you can see the significant amount of circumstantial evidence that's pointing to some kind of transformative event in Egypt during the reign of Amenhotep II. So it seems that, you know, until that day, until the Lord's return, there's always going to be room for people to justify their unbelief. Absolute certainty, as I said, that's beyond historical inquiry. But likewise, you see, there's room for intellectually satisfying faith. And I think the evidence of Israel and Egypt meets that. I find it intellectually satisfying. So that's why I've shared that with you. Thank you for coming. We'll carry on next week.